In the shadow of the ongoing military conflict in Ukraine and the condemnation of Russia, many of you wanted to see an episode about the U.S. focusing on how they spread democracy around the world, or shortly said, their wars. Is the U.S. worthy or are they worse than Russia? It remains to be seen. As you accuse me of pro-Russian or pro-Western statements, what about looking at topics that you suggest in the comments below? Let me know what would you like to learn more about. I will do my best to explain things as objectively as possible, despite the fact that I cannot endorse Putin's actions and his war. Now that I think about it, creating an episode called 50 Facts About Putin is a good idea. Now is time to take a more serious look at things and review the distant history of the founding of this country. We are transported to the 15th, 16th and 17th centuries after the discovery of the new land. The advent of the British and the French in the newly discovered northern continent and the Spanish in the southern one gave pretty rough time to the native people. Everyone thinks that as soon as the colonizers disembarked from their ships, the shooting of Indians and Aztecs began, but that wasn't exactly the case. The Spanish were really creeps and were killing people left and right, but the British were destroying the flora and fauna which the natives were relying upon for surviving. Thus rebellions broke out and were drowned in blood because of the technological superiority of the Europeans. Not to ignore the diseases brought over from the old continent, which helped greatly in the conquest. The New World, whether it be North or South America, was built by the colonizers at the cost of blood, no doubt. One of the myths of the creation of the U.S. is that the first settlers were mostly criminals. Actually, on record appears that the most numerous group were the pilgrims, these were deeply religious Christians who were downright horrified by the debauchery in good old England. So they set out on a perilous journey across the Great Water to found a new society based on their faith. Americans, up to this day, insert religion everywhere. They even worship the state as it was God. It is no coincidence that the motto of the USA is in God we trust. It is even written on their banknotes. So far we have the two Americas divided between British, French, Spanish, and Portuguese. The pressure of the British Empire on the 13 newly established colonies in North America began to increase, and this gave rise to tharts of secession from the empire. In fact, the tension and the pressure from the British was generated because of the many costly wars they fought over territory and the constantly increasing taxes on the new lands. The colonies in North America weren't willing to pay the tax, and so war began. Thus, the U.S. emerged as a state as a result of the anti-colonial struggle of the 13 colonies or territories against the British Empire. The country we know today as the USA was officially born on July 4, 1776, after the Declaration of Independence was signed. This was the document defining the separation of the USA from Great Britain. The three most important points of the Declaration are 1. Every man is free. 2. Every man has the right to pursue his own happiness, as long as he does not break the law. 3. Every man is equally responsible before the law regardless of his origin, race, religion, social status, and gender. However, some of the founders were slaveholders. Due to the rapid development of the colonies and the lack of laborers, they had to import slaves from Africa. I know, it sounds pretty wrong these days, but back then one-fifth of the population were slaves. George Washington, the first president of the USA, first started to fight against it. He was fully aware of the danger that the slavery issue would divide the still young American Republic. It actually did it in 1861, when the Civil War broke out. The South supported slavery because it was free labor while the North said it was against the ideology of the newly created country. Of course, there were many other issues to settle, but this was the main one. The Civil War of 1861-65 officially ended slavery in the USA. Northern leader Abraham Lincoln paid for it with his life after being killed during a theatrical performance. In the years that followed, there were several other major conflicts with the native population that shaped the territorial integrity of the states. All in all, the natives were pushed east and defeated. The descendants of the indigenous people in North America who came from several Indian tribes today live in 326 reservations that have special tax status. Indian reservations, as they are now called, became a gambling paradise, and the new native chiefs are earning colossal sums from the casinos. 
Although the U.S. fought a war against slavery in the 19th century to this day, the problem of discrimination hasn't been completely solved yet. African Americans weren't granted full equal civil rights until 1968, when their leader, Martin Luther King, was assassinated. Now it's turn to talk about the WW1. The U.S. didn't officially join it until April 1917, or a year before it ended. They were led by the Monroe Doctrine of Non-Intervention in the Affairs of Old Europe. This, in turn, prevents Europe from interfering in the affairs of the two American continents. These terms are also called isolationism. In fact, many people believe that Donald Trump's foreign policy is based on it. You remember he wanted to build walls, withdraw groups, and shut down the U.S. in general, which has its pros and cons. The U.S. is a presidential republic, which means the president runs the country, and he appoints ministers. Every president is entitled to two terms whether they are consecutive or intermittent. This ensures the impossibility of authoritarian rule. It is a little-known fact that being president of the U.S. is actually considered the most dangerous profession in the world. Currently, Joe Biden is the 46th president. Of all the other 45 presidents before him, four have been assassinated, and another four died, supposedly of natural causes. That's an 18% death rate in the line of duty. Let's go back to WW1. As the central powers in it won, and being involved at the very end, the U.S. managed to become a world leader in many industrial manufacturers. There was a real economic boom in the U.S. in the 1920s. Bulgaria, as you know, was one of the defeated countries alongside Germany, Austria-Hungary, and our historical enemies, the Ottoman Empire. That is to say, we actually fought against the U.S., and after this First World War, a second national catastrophe followed in Bulgaria. A very complex historical topic, perhaps for another episode. Ten years after the U.S. boom, the Great Depression broke out. It is considered to be the most serious economic collapse at a global level, but it is leading to powerful social changes. This economic crisis allowed the development of totalitarian ideologies, nationalism in Germany, communism in the USSR, and fascism in Italy. Take a breath and give it a thumbs up if you found everything here interesting and you liked it. But let's move on further to modern history, because there are some very interesting events in it. The U.S. only became militarily involved in the WW2 after the Japanese attack on Pearl Harbor in December 7, 1941. I stress the word military, because you may have heard of the Lend-Lease Program of 1941. According to this clever program, the President of the U.S. was authorized to give aid in the form of food, equipment, ammunition, and whatnot to countries that were fighting against Hitler. Even the USSR began to receive aid under this program after June 22, 1941, because until then, they were Hitler's allies. For the whole war, the U.S. sent supplies worth $50 billion, which today is $740 billion. They were actually involved with money, not for free, even before they got involved militarily. Here comes a rather dark point in the history of the U.S., the only country in the entire world that has used atomic weapons against an opponent. On the 6th and August 9, 1945, they dropped atomic bombs on the Japanese cities of Hiroshima and Nagasaki. Apparently, the fierce resistance of the Japanese military, who were considered Hitler's allies, convinced them to use this infernal weapon. With it, they also wanted to send a warning to Stalin that it was time to stop the Red Army's advance towards Europe. If you have watched my episode on the USSR, then you certainly know that after the WW2, the Cold War began. Let's look at it this time through the American perspective. After the war, in 1949, the US initiated the creation of NATO. Their main goal was to stop the Soviet Union. Today, NATO is considered the strongest military alliance in human history, with 30 member states, including Bulgaria since 2004. The demonstrated power of atomic weapons has led to quite serious tensions between the two great powers. Despite the promise not to use them, the U.S. has been carrying them around. In 1966, they lost four hydrogen bombs in Spain, causing anxiety all over the continent. It took them three months to find the bombs. But don't worry, after all, it was the 14th time they had lost an atomic bomb. Thank goodness there was no explosion, or at least none that we know of. Now is turn of the Vietnam War, American Army's biggest and worst defeat of all times. You must have seen it often in the movies. 
There are hundreds of them referring to the subject. The story is that in 1954, the Vietnamese finally got rid of their French colonizers, and the country was split in two. The Communist North was supported by guess who the Soviet Union, while the anti-communist South invited the U.S. to help. Guided by the so-called Eisenhower Doctrine, they believe that the greatest threat to the free world is the communist ideology. Based of this doctrine, the U.S. believed that communism had to be contained, and so they accepted the invitation of the South. This is how the Vietnam War began in 1965. Thousands of American soldiers were sent to fight against a terribly prepared army. Realizing they are losing, the Americans use dirty weapons again, this time in the form of Agent Orange which sprays the jungles. I've talked to you a lot about it in the charts. Nevertheless, the US loses the war with about a million and a half casualties on both sides. In the following years, both superpowers avoided direct confrontations, but supported over 20 military conflicts in Africa.